We're thrilled you're joining us for the first part of a five-part series on navigating today's healthcare system. This is presented by Ashby Village's Healthy Aging and Elder Action Groups. Dr. Sophia Chen, a geriatrician at Kaiser Permanente and an Ashby Village board member will lead today's presentation on the state of geriatric healthcare. Many of you are familiar with Ashby Village. Some may not be. We're a dynamic community of people transforming how we age. We support each other to age wherever we call home, with self-determination, with dignity, and with purpose. We have about 450 older adult members, 250 volunteers of all ages, and a dedicated network of partners and supporters. If you aren't already, a member or a volunteer, join us. Ashby Village presents these kinds of programs and this quality of programming free of charge, so it's accessible to everyone. If you're able to support our ability to offer free programming, please donate. There'll be a donation link right now in the chat. Okay, before I turn it over to Roberta Pressman, who will introduce Dr. Chen, I wanna thank Roberta for envisioning and shepherding, along with colleagues in Elder Action, this series investigating the challenges to optimal healthcare for older adults. Roberta is an Ashby Village member and a steadfast leader of our healthy aging and Elder Action work to improve the state of healthcare for older adults. Thank you, Roberta, and I turn it over to you. Good morning and welcome everyone to the first of our five presentations on navigating today's healthcare system. Before introducing our speaker today, I wanted to take a little time to give you some background <clears throat> as to how this series came to be. I think it's an interesting story, not just because of how much we learned, but because it's such a lovely story about what makes Ashby Village such a special place, a place where people <clears throat> can come together to socialize, but not just for services or to socialize, but also where we can get together to explore interesting topics and at times to take action, to make things just a little better for ourselves and for those around us. This series of presentations on healthcare is a good example of what can happen when some of us get together to explore an area of interest to us. The project was inspired by a talk which Dr. Louise Aronson, a geriatrician and author of the amazing book, Elderhood, gave at Ashby Village several years ago. In her talk, she discussed the numerous challenges that older adults face in obtaining, obtaining optimal health care. She noted the lack of sufficient geriatricians and lack of adequate medical research on older adults as issues of concern. But one of the most disturbing things she discussed was ageism, the negative stereotyping of older adults that has contributed to these lacks and continues to deter doctors and other healthcare professionals from specializing in geriatric medicine. Inspired by Dr. Aronson's talk, some members of our health and wellness team and our elder action interest group got together to learn more and most importantly, to explore actions we could take to improve geriatric medical care at a local level. We read articles, interviewed local physicians and researchers about these issues. And our elder action group helped us, helped us to launch the action part of this project. We began to collabor collaborate with numerous local organizations to advocate for improved working conditions and pay for home care workers, improved regulations of nursing homes, and we agreed to support the passing of long-term services and support for all in California, as well as several other issues, much too numerous to elaborate on today. This ability to act on some of the challenges we identified made it more than just an academic exercise for us and made what we were doing seem even more worthwhile. But besides these collaborations with advocacy groups, we made another and unexpected decision, and that was to produce a guide with tips for having a satisfying and helpful visit with your doctor, despite some current challenges getting in the way of that. 
we hadn't planned to do this at all, <clears throat> but we kept hearing from our members and other professionals about long waits to schedule medical visits and worse, less time with our physicians once we got to see them, with some doctors being asked to see three patients in an hour. So just at a time when we older folk may need more time because of more complex medical issues to discuss, or just because we might move more slowly as we age, we might find ourselves without sufficient time to discuss our concerns. Jessica, could you put the slide here? And this is a cover of the guidebook that we have put out. Um, and we hope it'll be have helpful hints to help you prepare more efficiently for your visit. We have easy ways to plan and prioritize your questions beforehand, a form list, a form to list all your medications to bring with you to your visit and other information to help you get better organized and prepared for your medical visits to make them more time efficient and hopefully more be beneficial to you. This guide will live on our website and we'll have hard copies also available at our in-person meeting on November 12th. Following over a year of study, our group decided what we have learned to, to share what we have learned and the issues we wanted to highlight, which is how these five presentations in our guidebook came to be. Before we begin our presentation today, I just want to take a few minutes to acknowledge some of the people who made major contributions to this project. A big thank you to Dagmar Friedman and Linda Rose, who drafted and edited our guide, to Joe Selby and Joanne Carter, who along with myself, looked into senior services at our local healthcare systems, and to Julie Freestone and Michelle Le Lefkowitz and others at Elder Action, who kept us connected to and collaborating with outside advocacy organizations. We thank you as well. And lastly, to our two staff members, Sharice Henshaw and Jessica Sterling, who provided much needed assistance in numerous ways to help me make these presentations happen. Thank you both. It was an interesting and fun venture, and I hope the information presented to you over the next few weeks will be of benefit to many of you. Today, as I said, is the first of our four Zoom presentations. Next Tuesday, October 1st, Jody Reed of CARA will be presenting important information to know should you be in need of hospitalization, either in an emergency or for a planned procedure. This presentation will be followed by three more, one on really important information on threats to traditional Medicare, another on an introduction to telehealth and healthcare portals, and our last one on November 12th, which will be in person and address end of life documents and other important issues related to dying well. Registration is still open for all of these events. Before introducing Dr. Chen, I wanna remind you all to put any questions you have for her in the chat and she'll be happy to respond to them after her presentation. But now I am so happy to welcome Dr. Sophia Chen, doctor of osteopathy and a working geriatrician at Kaiser East Bay. Dr. Chen's studies began at UC Berkeley where she studied molecular and cellular biology. She began her healthcare journey at UCLA where she obtained a master's in public health with a focus in community health and where she developed an interest in working with older adults. She pursued this interest at Stanford where she completed a fellowship in geriatrics. Now on staff at Kaiser, she works in the community at various nursing homes and visits patients in their homes, which she says continuously informs her search for improved ways to provide well-integrated health care. We are exceedingly fortunate that with all her busy professional activities and a young family to care for, she's found time to serve on the board of Ashby Village where she brings an important perspective on healthcare to our village. A big welcome to you, Dr. Chen. Thank you, Roberta. Um, 
That was so kind. Um, and actually, that was good to know the story. I didn't realize it came from another fellow uh, geriatrician um, that inspired this series and, and the work that you all do. So I also wanted to take a moment to thank Roberta for, for getting me involved. Um, as she said, things get really busy um, in life in general, but this is a particular interest to me. And so having her be a great instigator and, and advocate um, really, really helped propel a lot of this. And, and I'm thankful for that. So as always, hold on tight while I uh, share my screen and get this technology portion started. Uh, but really, thank you all for being here to listen to my little update on the current state of geriatric health services. I'm going to emphasize the term services here because as I see it, health care, that care component is something that really comes from individuals or groups of individuals in, in our society, not necessarily from the health services system, which is primarily a Western medicalized system, um, some akin to the Western military industrial complex, but that's a different topic. Because believe it or not, surprise, this medical system is focused on problems um, and, and more on problems that we feel that we can intervene upon based upon Western studies rather than upon health. So I should probably start by noting that geriatrics as a field is relatively new within this medical complex. Um, maybe many of your parents have not seen a geriatrician in any clinical setting as soon as they turn 65 which is more of an actuarial uh, designation than any sort of health designation of what an older adult is. Um, unless perhaps they were in the UK um, or the East Coast where you know some of these um, cultural nuances start to flood over to the West Coast. So while the term geriatrics was first coined pretty early, um, about 1909 um, in New York, Mount Sinai, geriatrics as a practice, as a medical field has really only established itself um, in the U.S. Uh, medical discipline in the last three decades or so. Since we as a society are living longer, um, aside from those blue zones of the world who probably got a head start, um, what is that saying from Okinawa, one of the blue zones where they have the highest concentration in numbers of centurions? Um, moving forward, probably not as the younger generation move away, but they did have about 35 centenarians for every 1,000 people in the population. Um, contrast that to about 10 per 100,000 in the United States. So that quote, um, which I do really do appreciate, um, says, at 70, you are still a child, at 80, a young man or a woman, and if at 90, someone from heaven invites you over, you tell him, just go away, come back when I'm 100. Um, so this is all to emphasize also that our society, the demographics um, continue to shift um, and things outside of the medical sphere more likely contributed to a lot of this um, understanding and progression of us living longer, older, um, healthier. That's a <laughs> debatable question. Um, but despite this known for, for many years now, aging tsunami, we are currently that we're currently witnessing and continuing to witness this rise of special care for older adults has been slow, very slow to develop. Um, so with that, um, I like to segue to um, my world of geriatrics. I start with my favorite comic just to um, start things out. So for those with sensory impairment, AKA poor eyesight like me, um, I like to read this out loud. So this is what I appreciate about my field as a pragmatist. So over in the upper left-hand corner, there's the cardiologist. Um, what he's saying is, hmm, conservative management for someone with a uh, heart failure or a poor heart ejection. Down at the bottom left, the intensive care specialist doesn't really see um, much to intervene on. So more of the ageism that um, was found per Roberta's um, comment about the previous geriatrician. Up on the right-hand top corner, the neurologist, uh, probably more testing, a lot more testing, not much to do, but more testing for the cognitive impairment. So that speaks to the medicalization of our healthcare field. And then down at the bottom right is the nutrition saying, if we cut her toenails, she might be able to walk better. So um, I would say um, often, and that's the, the topic of the ageism is, is the misconception 
that older adults are mostly a burden to society or there's not much to intervene on. Um, but the fact is, even today with the demographic change, many are still contributing um, continued work, continued childcare, continued maintenance of a household, simple things like meal preparation. Most live independently, most still volunteer, most still act in leadership roles in a community organization like this. Um, and in that context, they still are facing um, a lot of the geriatric symptoms. So increasing disabilities um, and leading to gradually significant impairments. So geriatrics is at that, to me, wonderful intersection of culture, family, finances, sexuality, life, just all the isms um, in conjunction with health issues. Um, so in geriatrics, we are actually incorporating more of those psychosocial determinants of health, right up my alley with the MPH, more than any other medicalized specialty. Um, a few more just demographic, you know, there actually has been more in terms of an improvement in the population of older adults. Education levels are increasing. Like I said, older adults are still working and working longer and more successfully. Poverty, um, that's questionable, but these are just general statistics. Um, and many that can live independently and, and are more actually diverse. And obviously the challenges that come with um, a lot of these um, disabilities and impairments. Um, a lot of chronic conditions, um, a lot more living alone, a lot with care gaps um, and don't have to kind of uh, speak to the choir, but just a lot in the uh, governmental and societal um, deficits um, of what it means to um, contribute to helping older adults um, in America. Continuing on. Um, so with the increase in longevity, there's been an um, increase in sort of cohorting or, or quartiling the older adults. Um, so we actually have been noticing that we're cutting the, the age groups um, by, by sort of the decades um, from actually 2022 until the projected 2060 or 2050, there's going to be a 47% increase in those just over the age of 65. And then what we call the oldest old, the 85 and above, there's actually going to be an even starker increase uh, on average about maybe 180%. Uh, known since we're in the health problems field that chronic conditions um, become more in number and more severe, sort of the flip in, in age. And so, like I said, we're starting to um, quantify um, and, and qualify if we can the various older adults. Um, some of you maybe in the 65 to 70, we call you young old. Um, 75 to 85 middle old and 85 and above old old. So more recently, there actually has been a revitalization to more research into the field of longevity, living longer, hopefully living better longer. But, um, you know, a lot of people are actually looking into how do we even stretch the old old even further, interestingly enough. Um, so yeah, we're living so long that parsing out these various quartiles or quantiles, um, each has their own you know, cohort nuance, but there's also this move towards, and anecdotally, you've probably experienced this, where you, you've seen people who may look a certain chronological age, but physiologically, they may seem older or younger than what you envision their chronological, their birth date, you know, age to be. Um, and so this is uh, where research in general is going in terms of trying to delineate out even more than just your chronological age, what interventions might be more helpful, what, you know, would be the match of where you are in your health versus what the intervention may or may not be. So geriatrics. Um, the field has gone through many different iterations of how we actually practice um, geriatric health care. And this is the most modern and newest iteration. Um, some say more palatable version called the five M's. Um, you may hear this in passing. You may hear it more in um, not your doctor's office, I would say, unless you see a geriatrician. Um, but this is a way that we've learned to condense and, and more easily describe what it is that you may or may not be seeing in a geriatrics 
prospective healthcare visit. So the five M's, mind, mobility, medications, what matters most, and through all of it, the multi-complexity. And always at the center, um, the patient-centered health or home um, is something that healthcare has been focusing more on throughout all the specialties um, and in various settings. So the geriatric 5Ms, I'll go through each of them um, somewhat. And this is akin to the booklet that Roberta and her team have created in that if your primary care physician has not been well informed about some of these focus areas with older adults and healthcare, um, it may be something for you to elicit towards your provider. Um, so without further ado, the mind. Providers and healthcare tend to go by this agency or group called the US Prevention Task Force making recommendations, more expert opinion than, than studies sometimes about what is helpful um, in a value-based care system to implement. Cognitive screening is something that they do not actually recommend for every older adult over the age of 65 in America. That's just kind of for all comers. Um, but I, I query that because I counter, do we really know all of the symptoms? There are some guides and some interesting symptomology that the Alzheimer's Association has put out for ten early signs of dementia, but the process occurs much, much earlier. Um, the term cognitive impairment may not include up to that severity of dementia, and so I, I counter that. Do we even know what the symptoms are of even mild cognitive impairment? Where research now is looking into how many more decades earlier does this happen when there are no obvious outward signs or symptoms? Um, but for cognition in, in a geriatric mind frame, um, so you may have symptoms of memory loss, forgetting names, forgetting appointments, recent events, in the next five minutes, or maybe you recall it later. Difficulty with tasks, problem solving, multiple stepped activities, following instructions, um, language problems, difficulty recalling words, speaking, generating, personality changes, um, anxiety, suspicions, judgment. Um, you don't have to be an older adult or anyone with cognitive impairment to be easily scammed, but wow. judgment is also in there. Yeah. Withdraw from society, um, hallucinations, vision and sensory impairment. So these cognitive concerns are, are key in a geriatric assessment because the, the goal is not necessarily to diagnose, but it is actually to understand the baseline, what has changed. Um, often there are changes that may or may not happen in an acute or short period of time, we call delirium. If you went to the hospital, maybe you recovered, maybe you didn't, but if you didn't have an assessment prior, we wouldn't know what that difference really was. Um, care partners or family members or friends may or may not know either. Hopefully they do, but that's the goal, to get a better baseline, to know what the change you know, trajectory has been. Um, is actually the more important part. You know what, can you? Mobility. Um, functionality is a term we use often. Um, falls, which was what we previously determined as a geriatric syndrome, um, is often called into question. Um, and in geriatrics, we often do a quick and easy physical test called the timed up and go, also known as tug, um, which basically measures how long it takes you to get up from sitting, walk about 10 feet, turn around, come back again. Um, I hate to say, but less than 10 seconds is normal and anything greater than 14 increases your risk of falls. Um, but actually the biggest predictor of mortality with function is actually your walking speed. Um, so mobility comes into question, but mobility, not just in physicality, but sort of also organizational abilities, um, your setting, the built environment. Um, there, there's a lot that goes into each of these, but it's a way to focus um, a provider. Medications. Medications should be a topic all on its own. Um, there's so many components to how a geriatrician thinks about medications. Um, often have colleagues uh, like in the hospital internal medicine, we call them hospitalists, who say, you know, I, I, I see older adults all the time. I'm basically a geriatrician. Um, but then I see them on the other setting side, which I'll go into later, but I see medications that stay on. I see medications that don't need to be there. Um, 
they understand what the indications are, but it's not just a matter of too many medications. Um, often the geriatrician is actually thinking about what is the true reason, the true indication for why you're on a medication. I see people on stool softeners for no reason, on um, anti-acid medications for no reason, and these aren't without side effects. Um, or the flip side is I see them not on medications because of that ageism. They're not on a medication for bone density because they are thought to be too old, or they're not on an aspirin. Re-evaluations. So the idea is that as the older adult's physiology, maybe metabolism changes, but also just proper practice, you should be continually evaluated for things such as an antidepressant or anti-anxiety medication. Um, there should be reconciliation of any medications that have been paused or not necessarily discontinued or you know, taken off or re-added from the time you're in the hospital to the time you're in a post-acute setting like the nursing home or to home or before, after a surgery. Those are the crucial times of, of medication management. And this term called time to benefit, um, just naturally longevity gets shortened as we get older, um, from the day you're born till the time you are not, um, but we call that prognosis. And so there are some studies showing, well, what is that time to benefit of that intervention, most likely medication from the doctor, and with the intended goal that it's supposed to have in your lifetime? Cholesterol medications aren't supposed to impact you from day one. The goal is that in 10 years time, you've prevented maybe a major event like a stroke or a heart attack or another clot, but not that it's going to do anything in the next you know, month or two. Medications with their adverse effects, um, even basic medications like your heart medications, there's so many different types. Not all are the best for older adults who maybe have the propensity towards falls, towards low blood pressures. Medications that maybe help other geriatric syndromes like urinary incontinence have a, a negative effect on cognition, these anticholinergic medications. And then lastly, this topic of deprescribing, slowly taking someone off a medication over time to see if it actually was doing anything for the older adult. So that's just in medications alone. That can take many, many visits. And then this multi-complexity. Um, Older adults, not just having the chronic conditions or severe chronic conditions, but different presentations of a symptom, um, not doing well in hospitals. There are actually studies that show that hospitalization alone, not just because of the older adult, is adverse to functionality. Um, up to, I think, 30 to 50 percent of older adults over the age of 75 may lose a singular function, an ADL we, we describe them as. Um, being able to dress oneself, being able to um, get up from sitting. Um, so these are all just the hazards of being basically stuck in a bed in the hospital. Um, hopefully they do some intervention with getting older adults up, but that's not common practice. And so older adults do tend to lose muscle mass every day you are immobile within the hospital. Thinking about, you know, is this procedure going to benefit, um, not just because of an older adult, but in general based upon their physiology. So many things with multi-complexity. Um, and then what matters most? Um, this has also become a, a big focus in healthcare where we're trying to get towards goals of care. Um, you've heard of quality of life, um, palliative care, um, but it's really the idea of being goal concordant with someone because this is their time. This is with more information about really helping you to understand your symptoms and your, your disease and the time to benefit of interventions. What is your goal? Um, it becomes more of a discussion, more of a collaborative um, visit about um, what would help one feel better about even that decision. So in a nutshell, the five M's of a geriatric perspective, not a lot, as Roberta um, quickly mentioned, and not something that's not unknown, but there are not enough geriatricians. I don't think there ever were, and there's never going to be. So not going to discuss much about the whys and, and how to recruit. There are multiple strategies on how to get more geriatricians, more you know providers in this field. Um, but the goal has never been to, to just do that. It's um, been to really provide the same framework to a healthcare system. And so the move now is with these shortages, with the um, 
the expertise, but the lack of manpower, if you will, to really incorporate it into systems of care, into aging friendly healthcare systems. So um, just, just to let you know how many programs of geriatrics there are out there, there are six within California. There has been this interesting kind of ratio of geriatricians to patients. Um, apparently these counties and these states have a, a the most healthy <laughs> proportion, um, but in Alameda County, it's actually pretty bad. <laughs> um, so like I said, things disseminate from the east to the west. And then so currently in America, there are about this many geriatricians that are practicing. Um, but this is to all of the um, health services providers, AKA doctors. There just aren't even enough primary care physicians. There may not be enough pediatricians. Um, a lot of reasons also why for why um, younger people are not choosing this career pathway. Um, and then if we were really to go into this topic, there are estimates that maybe there are 80%. We need 40,000 more geriatricians to really feel like we we're in a good place. Um, and that's not even to talk about geriatric psychiatrists or other specialties in other um, fields that have an older adult specialty as well. So like I said, the strategy is not just in the recruitment of staff, but how do we permeate the healthcare system? Um, so sometimes I, I take a step back and, and make sure we are talking the same language and understanding where healthcare really likes to intervene. So we often talk about levels, levels of care, levels of assistance, settings where those levels are going to be administered to. Um, and so just a, a quick little um, how to <laughs> navigate what we think about in the health services side with older adults of where we provide the health services care. Um, so levels of care, you can get your care in the clinics, the outpatient clinics, we call that ambulatory. The assumption historically is that you walk to your clinic, but there are people who wheelchair into their clinic or get transported by um, ambulance into the clinic, ironically. Um, acute care, so the hospitals, emergency rooms, and then post-acute, sort of in between, um, where um, you think about nursing homes um, or home health, episodic, skilled nursing care. You think about what are they providing, um, physical care, uh, physical therapy, um, organizational care, non-skilled caregivers, helping you plan, you know, um, where to live, what to do, what medications to take. Social, um, a lot of uh, what is lacking um, in, in, I think, a lot of um, older adult topics, um, although I think Bab recently mentioned it, but loneliness, um, isolation, um, socialization. And then I really stress this is a different way to organize it, medical versus non-medical. Um, and levels of care where the healthcare is, but also where are they providing it to? Sometimes the healthcare comes to you. Um, so where are you, the, the patient, the, the member of society? Um, so these are the various places. So single family home, where you may be now. Um, it could be an apartment, it could be a single family home. Um, what we call RCFEs, so residential living facilities for the older adults. So this is also considered home, but the type of home is maybe more uh, a complex or a uh, condo complex apartment that has some socialization from senior apartments all the way up to assisted living. Board and care, like a six room home, um, but you're getting assistance and some socialization. And then things that are that spread that spectrum, these continuity of care retirement communities. I'm not sure if you're familiar with say, Piedmont Gardens uh, or St. Paul's Towers, where you have the senior apartments, independent living, assisted living, um, all the way to skilled nursing to memory care. And then of course the skilled nursing facilities, um, a lot to say there. And so what really is the, the meat of this topic of this presentation today is the idea of moving towards that age-friendly healthcare system, health services system. And that primarily comes through the implementation or operationalization of models of care. So CMS or the Centers of Medicare, Medi-Cal or Medicaid have really, you know, tried to do innovations on, on how to, um, to see if projects really can have better outcomes, um, obviously save the health services system finances, um, but really they, they've been the ones that have promoted a lot of um, investment into what this looks like. 
It comes from many places, so it's a little bit unorganized. If anything, I'll say the healthcare health services system is very unorganized. A lot of duplicity, a lot of crossover. Um, and so back to speaking and then how we in the health services speak about things, um, where are these interventions happening? Acute, the post-acute, ambulatory, but like I said, sometimes that crosses over, um, not necessarily walking, maybe in a transitional period in a nursing facility before going back to wherever home is. Um, so I'll speak about a few of these, but to start, um, traditional geriatric implementation of the perspective that I just shared with you, the 5M now, um, would occur traditionally in what we call geriatric evaluation and management clinics, which now can occur, as you see in this left-hand column, in the acute, the hospital, the ED, um, where it's a consultative service, um, co-managing with the primary care doctor, co-managing with the hospitalist, co-managing with the discharging planning team um, of stabilizing some of those geriatric syndromes or the five M's and then handing them back off, uh, back to the PCP um, or um, you know, just a short period of time of stabilization before they get re-referred again. So this was found to be more effective than, and I put here in the right-hand side, the ambulatory um, geriatric primary care. I think I still hear today a lot of patients um, in, I, I function in a memory clinic, so ambulatory, where often they, they're seeking, there's this idea that, that they need a geriatric primary care doctor. Um, that model has, I feel, really um, been passe. Um, there are some places that still do this, um, and they're the ones that have done it more successfully, um, where you do need to meet criteria. Um, at Stanford, their geriatric primary care clinic, you have to be 80 or 85 years and above, have five or more comorbid conditions. Maybe you're really accepting palliative care. So it's really this you know, um, select population or panel that they would be um, caring for. Um, but actually, in the Southeast, there's this interesting model called ChenMed, um, where it's primary care just for those 65 and above in the Southeast, started by cardiologists. And so their panels are, are much smaller. As you know, primary care doctors are seeing more patients with less and less um, availability and, less and, and fewer uh, minutes to spare. And so this was a, a model that actually has been working um, in Atlanta, they've been in expanding to Virginia. And so we'll see how that, that goes for, for a certain population. Um, another way to describe a population like that is the PACE programs. Um, if not familiar, this program of all-inclusive care for the elderly, PACE um, as a moniker, was actually started in San Francisco in the 70s, um, started as the program on lock. And so the idea is that if you have Medi-Cal or Medicaid as insurance with Medicare, and you're older than 55, and you're not living in a medical facility like a nursing facility, but you would otherwise reside there um, due to the needs that you have with assistance, um, it is a separate sort of healthcare system that provides all of that care, the preventative, the primary care, the hospital care, the long-term care. Um, not long-term care in terms of where you live, but um, if you need skilled services to do rehabilitation. Um, and so they only see older adults in their outpatient ambulatory clinic and have smaller panels as well. Um, but it means you choose this. In Oakland, it would be CEI. Um, they're the local PACE program, if you will. Um, going back to the acute side. So I, I do want to spend time with some of these because they are what is happening. Um, I've highlighted the ones that are relatively new, new in the last um, maybe five to 10 years or even one year in the somewhat yellow, <laughs> the highlighter color. So next I wanna talk about the geriatric or age-friendly emergency department, uh, ED. So we're noticing that actually not just in the internal medicine or family medicine or hospital medicine providers or doctors, it's actually in the specialty care um, health fields that are really looking into this age-friendly healthcare system idea. So in the emergency room, there have been a few pilots along the years um, focused really on orthopedic types of surgeries, so hip fractures. Studies have shown that for older adults who have fallen, broken a hip, 
surgery is actually a great predictor of mortality, um, decreased pain, not for everyone, but in large studies, it's, it's shown to be beneficial. And so sort of the anti-ageism. Um, in Oregon, they had actually, West Coast, um, started a, a quick little project, which probably segued to, to a lot of these, um, where it was about the hip fracture. Um, and the idea was that if an older adult came in with a hip fracture to the emergency room, sort of your first entryway into the acute hospital care, that they would actually go through a special kind of pathway. You would have your loved one with you or someone who understood um, confusion, um, someone who was comfortable to you and, and you know, someone who's, you know, someone at least who understood the, the process of what that hospitalization would look like. You would get the surgery quickly without too much wait time in the emergency room. You would get physical therapy right away um, and you would be out of the hospital in a shorter period of time, your length of stay. Um, and they showed that that actually improved health outcomes in terms of the delirium, the functionality. These all actually worsen someone's physical comorbid conditions and also save the hospital money, right? So the system won in that specific and particular pathway. Um, so that was the hip fracture fast track. But now they've incorporated it into certification for emergency rooms. So there's this pathway that they can be certified now where the emergency department has um, multidisciplinary team, you'll hear that a lot, social workers, um, leadership, just understanding what it is to decrease some of those things I talked about, delirium, lack of functionality, um, and getting them through the ED and recognizing some maybe care gaps before they discharge them out of the emergency room if they're not admitting them to the hospital. Um, and actually right now, Kaiser Walnut Creek and San Francisco are certified. Um, so along with that comes that surgical specialty. Um, some of um, Ashby Village has heard me speak about this idea of senior surgical. Um, our surgical specialty um, leadership um, and just the, the, the accrediting services have understood as well that surgeries are not easy, but they're also not exclusive to younger people. And so another sort of package interdisciplinary idea of evaluating an older adult for certain types of surgeries, not all, since it's still in, in its nuances, um, of amplifying, you know, if you, we think in this kind of big discussion, big evaluation of multi-specialties, multi-different um, uh, sort of ancillary staff of understanding where you are before your surgery and amplifying you to after, that the outcomes are, are going to be better and maybe more meaningful. Um, so including those components of the geriatric 5Ms, you know, what is the goal? Is it really the surgery or is it the um, being able to just get out of a chair? Uh, maybe it's not really the goal to walk, but just being able to be independently um, what we call transferring um, or getting, you know, to a, a faraway place on an airplane. And that's really all your goal is. Um, so a lot of that is happening with senior surgical and same thing as the emergency department. They are being certified for that. So Oakland Kaiser is another one, um, Oakland Richmond and Oakland Walnut Creek. Um, so it really is a way to decrease um, everything I spoke about for the emergency department, uh, but for surgery specifically. ACE units, again, more on the East Coast, um, these acute care departments or units in the hospital um, that only had uh, populations older than the age of 65 would be cohorted together. So the idea is that the, the sum was greater than the components alone, um, where it's synergistic to have a, a team staff co-locating with other older adults in the hospital for better outcomes. Some examples of these are the hospital would not have you individually be in your room and, and eating your meal, but in your hospital stay, you would go out and eat communally with the other, um, if they were able, patients in the hospital. There would be lighting um, in the hallways that would make it easier and decrease the risk of falls. There were nurses that were committed and consistently trying to decrease delirium, um, basic things like orienting someone to the day, opening up the, the blinders to the day. Uh, you'd be surprised how many hospitals still don't do that, even though it's, it's general and common knowledge that that helps prevent delirium or short-term confusion, which does have um, worsened cognition in, in certain populations, um, even after the hospital stay. To that, um, there have been attempts in the West Coast to try to do what we call a roving 
um, ACE unit. I think Kaiser Oakland had tried that as well. Stanford has this, something like that, where it's uh, uh, not a cohorting, so you lose out on some of that syner synergy, but sort of like a geriatrics and delirium moving um, consultative service to a hospital. That's actually what um, this hospital elder life program is. This has been a program that's been around for, for many years, actually started by nurses, um, where they're trying to decrease the risk of delirium in hospital patients. And so it's a structured way rather than just, you know, hey, please do that. Hey, please do that nurse in unit one, um, but actually a delirium prevention model that started in 1999 and, and some hospitals do this. So the idea is there's all these, you know, great ideas and, and protocols but it still is dependent on each healthcare service system in the United States, in California, to implement them. Hospital at home. This one is, is very interesting. Um, a lot of studies are pointing towards an older adult being in their home environment is beneficial. I think we all know that, but the healthcare system slow is starting to understand that. Um, and so there's pilots going on even in Kaiser or in, in the East Bay, where if you meet certain criteria, Say you're only going in for a pneumonia and you only need IV antibiotics every single day. Currently, our model is you stay in the hospital until you're done with that five day, seven day course. We see how you're doing um, and or we transition you to oral medications and then we send you out. Out means some people may go to a nursing home because they've stayed for five or seven days and now they're weaker um, or they got confused because infections can cause confusion. And so they're staying longer in a nursing home and then maybe they're going to a boarding care or an assisted living after that and not actually their home home unless they came from assisted living to start with. This idea is that you start right away in the home. So for certain, like I said, pneumonia things that are more straightforward, um, the idea is that you get evaluated, you then are set up with uh, staffing that go to your home, nurses who do the antibiotics for you. But the majority of the time as you're in the hospital, in the hospital, you're often just waiting around. You're waiting for your body to heal or recover um, with whatever is happening. And the interventions that the hospital services give you are not 24 seven. Most of it is just monitoring. And so there's ways to monitor remotely or monitor with people coming into your home environment. So hospital at home has been a new promise that's been happening for older adults, especially. Um, some of these are crossing. So PACE definitely crosses over to outside of the hospital. As I said, it's sort of a healthcare system in parallel. Skilled nursing facilities, I think we're all aware of what these are. Um, and I put this in parentheses because it's not really happening now, but it, it's an idea that may come forth. There's also nursing home at home. Um, having the, the skilled rehab, the skilled um, uh, social services and some of the aids come to your house rather than spending it at one of these large facilities or smaller facilities, which is what home health typically does. So home health is not a caregiver. Home health is not someone that comes in and you know helps you bathe or things like that. This is a physical therapist, an occupational therapist, a speech therapist, um, a social worker or a nurse that comes and episodically, a couple times a week, comes to do what a, a skilled nursing facility may do. Care at home. So I wanna highlight actually the top transitions and care at home. There are many, many models um, with these two uh, foci. Um, I'll start from the top. Transitions, as I said, there's been a lot of focus on when you're moving from one healthcare level or setting to another. So actually when the most er medical errors happen, um, the most confusion, the most just a chaotic time. So transitions comes in many flavors of operation and models in um, the healthcare services side. One example of that is called um, Bridge, where they found that if you had a clinic ambulatory, um, primarily set up for a post-hospital discharge, you actually get more time with the provider or um, the team. And they really are the ones that are trying to reconcile what had happened to you in the hospital and what is appropriate for you in your home environment. Um, transitions phone calls and sort of this short-term case management program um, has been something that has been ongoing for a while now too, where you get called by nurses, pharmacists, and they continue to call to make sure that the medication regimen, your understanding of it is, is happening um, for a couple of weeks at a time to sort of ensure a smoother transition. 
one clinic visit may not be the most helpful. And so they found that calling multiple times with multiple touch points is helpful. They're at petition. Um, boost, sometimes they're um, and align. These other kind of just acronyms for services that are all somewhat similar, but the target is the same. They help with the transition of calling out and um, triaging certain discharged patients from the hospital, uh, of making sure they get more wraparound services, um, making sure that the home environment is already set up, that they're safe to discharge, um, and all the, the supplies and things are, are, net, are met. All right, going lastly to, to the right, the ambulatory. Um, this is such a disorganized healthcare system, but trying to, to put them all into the certain pieces. Um, so let's see, fall prevention. Um, as I said, that's a, a big geriatric syndrome, um, which we are now putting in the M of mobility for geriatric assessment. Um, there are fall prevention education pieces, fall prevention safety pieces, um, and that comes together in programs that try to prevent it with home visits. So you can meet that criteria if you get skilled home services, like a home physical therapist. Um, but if you don't, but you're still a fall risk, then you may benefit from this service where it's an extra service that a occupational therapist comes to your home, evaluates for safety, does some other measures, um, training, um, gait, and just a lot of other things to kind of help prevent that from happening specifically. So it's just a, a specific um, 5M that is being targeted in the out side of the hospital and nursing facility setting. Um, medication management. So uh, Medicare actually started this where if you meet certain criteria, where if you have more than five medications or this much of a copay for you and this many comorbid conditions, you will be selected to get just a singular evaluation, uh, phone call to your primary care physician about what medications to, to avoid, um, to watch out for, to make sure that it's actually um, appropriate. So that 5M of medication. Um, this is one pathway that Medicare has been trying to kind of um, reconcile. Um, adult day health centers, um, cognition. So these are, if you will, akin to, to daycare um, for, for young people, where it's not just a senior center, it's not just a activity or class that you can go to, but it's kind of a, a half day all day programming where they provide medications they might have um, rehab staff on board um, and up to the level of what you're able to do a lot of them are based upon those with dementia or those who have cognitive impairment they have activities that are structured they may help with bathing or showering and they may help with transportation and it's really a, a form of respite for care partners um, and then um, i think i missed back here there's a lot to say home care um, home care comes again also in many flavors with the healthcare services in terms of specialty care, medical care, not um, non skilled care of someone who's just taking care of your basic needs like toileting, feeding, things like that. Um, but sort of medication management, the five M's. Um, home based primary care is one of those types of care where, again, it's like geriatric primary care in the office. But instead, you're in your home because you're deemed to be homebound to Medicare definition. And the primary care comes to you. Um, again, 80 or above, a lot of comorbid conditions, a lot of criteria. Um, some have spun off into what we call palliative primary, where all of that still holds true, but now you have more of a palliative focus. Um, your goal, not all the way to hospice, but your goal is more about comfort um, rather than curative. Um, so those are another models. Grace is another model. Um, it's a geriatric assessment and resources for the care of elders. Um, and then this is a new one, sorry to move back to ambulatory, all the way at the bottom, the yellow, guiding and improved dementia experience. Um, those who are, are keeping track of what Biden and Harris had been doing um, in the sphere of dementia care, this is um, one of their big plans from last year. It's still being rolled out, but the idea that healthcare systems, they know that they need more support. And so with Medicare funding, um, if you show that you're in a pathway of an interdisciplinary team, um, that you're helping with um, care partners, the caregivers, and, and more support there, be it with support groups, classes, not paying for their time directly, that's a whole different non-skilled issue, 
um, that they will fund your healthcare system. Um, unfortunately, HMOs like Kaiser are excluded. So yeah, you'll see how many of these programs actually rely on a team, we call the interdisciplinary team. Um, a lot of them have various um, amounts of staff, um, various levels of expertise, um, but social workers, case managers, or social workers or nurses that do more intensive follow-up, nurse practitioners, physician's assistants, clinical nurse specialists in geriatrics, all of these are, are the staff that the healthcare systems are relying on um, to make up for that lack of provider specialty in geriatrics. These APPs or advanced practice providers, you'll see a lot more if you haven't already um, sprinkled throughout all of these teams that do all of these different models of care. But again, the idea is that we're just trying to herd all our cats together um, and get more of us on the same page with those five M's. Time, let me know if I'm short on time. Um, this is another way of looking at sort of those components that may be part of that interdisciplinary team um, and how many of those components are in which programming. Let's get through that. And just is also another way of looking at it as well. Which of these models of care on the left, sorry, these are so small, have which components and how many components of that interdisciplinary team or that intervention that I was talking about. So um, that's the nitty, nitty gritty. Um, I did wanna take a moment to focus more on um, the built environment. Uh, I told you that in geriatrics, we don't look primarily at health care services or medicalized um, pharmacological Western um, interventions, but also psychosocial, um, also the environment. And where people live is a big part of that. So if you haven't already, I did want to share quickly an idea of aging, which you may see um, in our local area. So this is the Netherlands. Here, we're not hearing any sound. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Let me try this. And also, you need to speak a little more slowly. We're getting some requests. Will do. Can anybody hear this? Turn up the volume. No, Sophia, I'm sorry. The sound doesn't seem to be working on this. Okay, so sorry about that. Um, I will send the link. Um, okay. Basically, um, the idea is that um, specifically in dementia care and places where people, oops, places where people live, let me get out of this. Um, move on to the next one. Um, the environment, even in memory care centers, isn't necessarily conducive to the type of symptomology um, that various patients with dementia or those living with dementia have. And so this is not even new. This is 2009 in Amsterdam and city outwards of there, where it's an enclosed environment. Think of the memory cares you have here, Silverado, various places in Berkeley, um, where it's like a apartment complex, but it doesn't feel like they're out in the community. And so this particular built environment, kind of the idea of co-living with stores and, and normal parts of life, like a, a salon or a grocery store are all there in the lower level. It's secure and safe, but no money is being transacted. The staff are all well-versed in how to manage behavioral symptoms with dementia. Um, and this is just an example or another model of care for dementia care with how people live. Um, also go quickly to another organization called Choices in Aging in Contra Costa, where they're thinking about some sort of built environment. Um, like the idea of transitions of care where you have senior apartments, assisted living, just sort of the continuum of care that you may need, but it's more the idea of outdoors, combining it with 
lower um, intergenerational families, preschoolers, as you can probably read for yourself, um, with sort of that whole lifespan um, uh, of what might be a beneficial intervention with the social determinants of health. So um, with that, my intergenerational family, and um, if there are any questions, um, happy to answer. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you so much, um, Sophia. Wow, that was a lot of information. And uh, and so I think my first question is, um, are you willing to share your presentation actually with our attendees today? Great. Definitely, definitely. People asked about that. So um, that's good to know. Number two, uh, I want to remind everybody that there is a recording of this presentation available on our YouTube channel, um, either, I mean, in the next couple of days. So you have a chance to um, to view it again if you if you want to. And now on to some of the questions. There are lots of questions. I don't think we have enough time to get to all of them, but we'll try. Um, the first question was, how would a Kaiser member get referred to you? How many geriatricians are there in the Kaiser system? And in general, how to find a geriatric doctor at Kaiser? Um, yeah, <laughs> I figured that would be a question. Try to kind of uh, caveat it in that there just aren't enough, as you all know, in the field. Um, so I sometimes say that may not be the most um, helpful question to have answered. Um, I can tell you how many, I can tell you sort of the pathways, but I'm not sure it's going to be the way that would be most helpful to older adults moving forward in our healthcare services, like I said. So um, in Kaiser East Bay, every Kaiser is sort of a different little community, if you will. Um, in Kaiser East Bay, we have, I think, about four. The problem is that we're hidden. We're hidden in all these other areas of healthcare where you may not interface with us unless you get to that certain level of care or necessity of care. So um, as Roberta mentioned, I'm in the nursing facilities in the community. Um, I'm in home visits for some patients and then some patients come to me in the memory clinic. So the easiest way is to have a memory concern, talk to your primary care doctor and get referred that way, uh, sort of the secret geriatric um, pathway. But again, might be wait times, might not be someone I can see regularly, um, sort of a consultative service. And then across the entire Kaiser um, service area of Northern California, ranging from Sacramento down to Santa Cruz, um, there's probably a couple hundred of us. So again, hidden, doing various things, because probably the most effective for us is to sprinkle what we can and sort of change the dynamic within the healthcare system. One-on-one -on -one visits may feel like it is something you are getting a benefit out of, but it may just be a, a one-time. It may not be something where if you go to another provider, you're not getting that same interaction. You go to, like I said, to the hospital, to the emergency room until they're all age-friendly. You're going to get a very spotty kind of experience wherever you are, Sutter, Stanford, UCSF, Kaiser. Um, it's patchwork. It's Sorry, it's like patchwork. <laughs> If I ask for a gait and balance test, will my Kaiser doctor know what I'm talking about? Um, probably not. Um, I think a lot of what, in my perspective, what providers should understand is where their limitations are. Um, and so a doctor without the 5M training may not know about the tug test that I spoke about. And so they may refer you to physical therapy, actually, who may be the most proper place to get evaluated overall um, for a gait and balance issue. Um, a very important question, I think. What, if anything, is being done to train medical students about the care of older adults? I hear that many students don't even have a, a rotation um, plant in, in, their, in geriatric medicine. Yeah. Um... As far as I understand, but they may have changed it recently, it's not a requirement. But a lot of historical residencies have kept on geriatrics as they do with other specialties um, so that it's part of the breadth. So I came from four weeks throughout my entire residency training, um, four weeks total. At Kaiser Oakland, I can speak to, they spend two weeks with my department and they spend two weeks with CEI, the um, Centers for Elder Independence of PACE program here in Oakland. 
every medical school is different. Every residency program is different. Um, since most of us older adults won't get to see a geriatrician, are there specific tests our internists should be doing at our annual visits? Um, I think you're speaking to lab tests. Lab tests are not necessarily all the tests that we may do. Like I said, there might be a cognitive screen. Um, there might be a assessment about your organizational abilities. There might be an assessment about your mood. These are all what I would consider crucial tests, actually. Kaiser is actually pretty good about mood screens. They're annoying, but you might get a message from your doctor saying, answer about your mood in a Likert scale, you know, most likely, less likely. Um, until people use something with what they're asking for, I think in general, um, it's not always that useful. Like your primary care doctor asking for your annual slew of lab tests, your CBC, your BMP, your A1C, your TSH, your B12, unless they're gonna do something about that, unless something has changed, it's not the most value-based intentional care and experimental, you know, the idea of truly making a change that I see in medicine in general. Um, so for geriatrics, we do, everything's based upon the, you're talking to someone, but that takes time, the interview what you think the risks may be. So maybe asking about alcohol, maybe ask about nutrition, asking about other symptoms, then that kind of dictates us to what to order. But just a general panel of tests, there's no necessarily recommendation. There is for dementia workup or cognitive workup. So a B12, thyroid, TSH, and then just um, some of the chemistries to see if your electrolytes are in balance. But even with that, in the studies, just getting a pure BMP, meaning your sodium, your chloride, your BUN, your creatinine, all of those labs aren't helpful. They don't do anything for the evaluation that the primary care doctor is going to have. So in the sphere of dementia, not just a geriatric perspective, just the sodium is enough, or just your, um, your GFR or your clearance and your kidney function is enough, not the whole panel. So I can't answer that in terms of a, a generalized way, but for dementia, definitely the B12 the TSH, um, and just some of the chemistries. If a family is not if family is not available to help navigate health services or health care, what do you recommend someone to do get help navigating their services or their care? It's, um, I think, in um, America with our, our capitalistic health care system, that's also confused with um, sort of uh, medical necessity? Um, is it a right? Is it a benefit? We're so confused. <laughs> it's a mix of everything. If you have low enough income or you qualify for Medi-Cal, you actually do get a good, somewhat of a spectrum of services that can help with navigation. Um, there are programs that social workers can point you towards like MSSP, where they have some geriatric um, case manager or just case managers in general. Um, if you have lots of funds, you can pay out of pocket for one of these geriatric case managers. Or those most of us in the middle, um, it's a hodgepodge of is it a you know an unbefriended older adult with a kind of link to Ashby Village or is it a link to um, another community organization um, or is it a um, program that certain healthcare systems chose to choose to have like Kaiser? We have something called complex chronic conditions. So varying kind of, you know, who meets the criteria, all these things that doctors and healthcare systems talk about criteria, unless it's tied to Medicare, Medi-Cal finances, it's very variable if they'll accept you or not. I sort of analogize this to hospice. Did you know that the majority of hospices in America are for profit? So depending on which agency you get into or you choose, they will accept you based upon a very kind of loose set of criteria. So similar to the idea of these kinds of services, they're seen as extra, unfortunately, um, within the health services system. They're more the idea of, um, and I know Roberta can speak more about this, where there are just you know project ideas of uh, medical pals or, or people that are adjunct to a older adult in the community. Um, it, it's something I think a social worker would be a bit better to answer. Um, but again, in certain healthcare systems and certain incomes that you have, there are services that may or may not be available to you. But I would say just a case manager, if not in society, who did this? It was the village, people around you. Um, yeah. My understanding from helping a neighbor complete a PACE assessment is that qualifying for PACE services requires you have both Medicare and Medi-Cal. Is that true? Yes. It's a, a healthcare system where you just, do, all of you 
Currently with Medicare and Medi-Cal, you can designate, right, which health care provides the care and then health Medi-Cal or Medi-Cal pays for it. They're the payment that comes with some requirements. And so not many people accept it, but um, PACE is a Medicare, Medi-Cal. You dump all the money and they try to do what they can. Each PACE organization is different. They may or may not offer certain services like transportation, an adult day health center, a primary care office, doctors that go into the hospital and manage your care versus from far away. So it just depends. But it is a Medi-Medi, uh, definitely. I saw a quick question alongside for MSP, it's also a Medi-Cal benefit. And now with California changing its idea of who will provide your Medi-Cal and Medicaid or Medi-Cal and Medicare, it has to be the same organization now. So historically, you can have Kaiser with your Medicare Advantage, and you can have Contra Costa as your Medi-Cal, providing other services that are not always medicalized care. With Cal-AIM that had started last year or this year, it's slowly rolling out. California as a state forced them to make you choose one. So your Medi-Cal and Medicare is all Kaiser or all Alameda Healthcare Alliance or all whoever. Uh, given the shortage of geriatricians, can you speak to how existing geriatricians are being used? Are they mostly consultants or do they have their own private practices? Um, there are still, I think, the solo uh, private practice in any field, primary care or um, just all adults age 18 and above, and then the solo geriatrician. Um, it is something where it's, I think, it switches if it's not the old standing solo practitioner um, who sees only older adults, then it's going to be where they pivot to a concierge model. The idea is that being an individual provider is not necessarily sustainable um, in this kind of solo primary care model. Um, and so most of us in systems, we're all in systems because geriatrics in a system, we don't provide the system in our capitalistic healthcare society. We don't provide money. We save money, but it's hard to study that and to prove that as well. And so a lot of us tend to find areas where we can help with transitions of care, nursing home level of care, because that's where we see a lot of transitionings. I, many geriatricians don't love to be in the nursing home or facilities, but if you think about those five Ms, we do, because that's when I can solve things. <laughs> I can have a chance to change things before they get to their primary care doctor who may or may not understand these things. After they've been you know, dealt with the acute side, but the something's going on where I don't think the hospital side is addressing it. So we are hidden. Like I said, I'm in home care, home-based care. I'm in the nursing facilities, sometimes memory care, sometimes palliative care, um, geriatricians, sometimes co-fellowship um, into palliative care and geriatrics, um, Jerry Pals. And then I think the ideal is to be in, in systems where we are more administrators um, you'll see them actually um, sometimes in nursing home medical directorships, but often they're not geriatricians too. So you never know, um, but we are hidden. Um, is hospital at home possible for solo agers? That is, um, I think, depending on the triage of what you meet as criteria, you have to be able to be at home. Even from the nursing facilities, if you have not, um, I think the misconception of nursing facilities for rehabilitation is that you're going to get back to how you were before. That's really not the intention. Uh, most people enter the nursing facilities because of non-skilled disability. No one around them to help them get up to go to the bathroom. No one to help them rotate in the bed, to help them give them their medications. And so if that's not something that is possible in the home setting for the hospital at home, unless a system decides to tie caregiving finances and resources to have a home health aide come and help you with whatever you need. That's also dependent on how many hours you need. Some people need eight hours of helping because toileting may be at the whole day um, and some people only need four hours. So that may be more possible. So I think it's up to the individual operations of what can they manage of the resources to offer a hospital at home. Right now it's very, very strict because it is a new model. So I'm assuming you have to be pretty independent or have caregivers or care partners, not necessarily family members who can provide the basic care for you because that is not medicalized care. Yeah, and that actually also, the next question also deals with the hospital at home. Can you actually re request hospital at home? Or is no. this proposal to yet be implemented? Yeah, a lot of these newer models, because they want to see success, they are going to cherry pick 
based upon their criteria. And like I said, um, I understand that it's only pneumonia at this point because it's easy to administer IV antibiotics for most pneumonias um, and probably a, a whole slew of the social determinants of health of what you your pre-existing what we call complexity scores maybe. Um, who has to refer you to some of these at-home services available through Medicare? Does the typical internist know about these services and how to access them for you? Um, so I'd start with saying in only the medicalized skilled skilled services, because I would say caregivers are skilled in many ways, but we're talking about the medical system. So physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists, social worker, dietitian, those are the slew of people, social workers, that we deem to be services that can be ordered for the home. And I would say most um, providers know about this. It's called home health, skilled home health. So Medicare does not pay for the non-skilled caregivers. Medi-Cal does, but only a certain amount of hours. Um, and so that's a social work ability to help you apply for those forms. And then at the end, the doctor signs it. But in terms of Medicare, it's just skilled home services that are once a week, twice a week for a short period of time, a couple months. You're not going to have a, a nurse be your helper for, for years or for um, unless you have a catheter, actually. So sometimes with catheters, you can have a skilled nurse come every month. But every other day, every minute hour of your day is up to you to pay out of pocket or qualify for low income support. Um, what can we consumers do to advocate with our healthcare systems for more doctors trained in the treatment of older adults? Um, that's, <laughs> I think that's a, a larger question that I always wonder about in terms of impact. Um, where can you get the most impact? Right now, healthcare systems are income driven. Um, they are payment models driven, capitalistic, right? Unless they have a, a FQHC or a government kind of half model. So the membership matters. So it is true that I think your voice matters, but in just like a review or just a member kind of feedback, I'm not sure that would be the most impactful. I know Kaiser, not anymore, but they used to have senior voices as like a um, uh, leadership, um, uh, what do you call them? just in terms of um, a voice um, that, that would really be listened to. So getting groups like that set up for the membership, for the, you're the consumer, right? The consumer side in this product called health services. Um, I would actually kind of say probably going towards more um, public relations or the government <laughs> those sides, but uh, I'm not the most um, po politically active. I might defer to, to Roberta on that, but in terms of your particular healthcare private system, um, some sort of leadership voice, getting a, a seat at the table with the leadership is probably the most beneficial. For me, also strategy within a healthcare system, um, going to those specialties, those with more power and say within the healthcare, like our surgical partners, our emergency room department um, partners has proven to be more effective. Um, so it's a bigger question of, of impact, I think. Um, Sigurd, could I intervene for just a second on this issue? I was just going to say that um, one of the points that Sophia has been making all the way through is about the medical system and how it's so income driven. And one of the solutions to that is to have a different type of system like health care for all. And that's one of the things that citizens can work to to try to get implemented, which is getting away from our insurance-based systems and into a health healthcare for all. So if you want to join us at Elder Action to work for that, we're welcome to have you. Yeah, and I would say also time to benefit for that, just to jump in, um, that do you want to change your doctor today in the next year, your healthcare system in the next 10 years, or like Roberta, America in the next 20 years, sort of where do you want to have the impact for yourself time-wise? Um, so you can, I mean, I would still urge you, like, tell your doctor, and with that packet that the Roberta team came up with, basically telling them what we think an older adult evaluation should be is a way to change that for that particular provider. Uh, so 
someone said this was a great introduction to what programs are in the pipeline. However, what about navigating the system? Is it just hit or miss that the clinic or healthcare care organizations we utilize happen to use some of these systems? What about the how to navigate mentioned in the presentation presentation description? Do we as patients have any control or choice over this? Um, nihilistically, no. Um, that's just, I think, for a lot of the health services side. Um, but I, I do think that it is, so sorry about that. I think that navigation is, is also a, a challenge of um, what resources you have um, tied to yourself in navigating it. Because if you are in a Kaiser system, I can give you a certain answer. If you are in a Stanford system, it will be a different answer. If you have finances and you have ability to have a, a care navigator, that's a different answer. Um, if you have Medi-Cal, then you have, again, a different answer. Um, so if I haven't emphasized it enough, um, the healthcare system is very messy. It's very old. Um, it is not efficient at all, despite what we promise we do for you in terms of health problem solving. Um, we don't solve our own healthcare systems problems. It's it's new to us um, and it is a hodgepodge patchwork. Um, and, and until you have, and it's not just about knowing about it, like you said, knowing is one thing. Navigating is having a service that will do that for you. That unfortunately is out of pocket or through Medi-Cal somewhat. And it is where some healthcare systems um, will have a hospital at home and some won't. Um, some will have home-based primary care and some won't. So even within Kaiser, Northern California, not every service area has the same services. Um, someone actually asked about a slide that you showed, the multi-complexity gap, and it says it goes from number 12 health equity to number 22 urinary. What are 13 to 12? Oh, <laughs> sorry, I just gave you an example of, of some of those um, conditions and things that geriatricians, I feel like surgeons get a better training on truly thinking about the pros and cons of a lot of conflicting conditions. So for one, not those, you know, those numbers, but I can send it to you later, 13 to 21. Um, for instance, in my memory clinic, I know that sleep is important for cognition, for recall, that's where you actually put things into long-term memory. But what if someone um, basically has urinary incontinence that wakes them up every night? The problem with that is that to solve that, it's not, it's com complicated, but there's a medication that can do that. But there's a medication that can do that that makes you more confused. And so there are people who, which one do you take priority as, right? And that becomes where I can inform you about the side effects, what I think is more important, but then the relationship with the patient of, is the urinary incontinence and poor sleep more important to you to solve, even if it counteracts with your cognition? How much are you willing to kind of you know, negotiate what might be the the pl the path that we take together on on what to do. Um, so that's just an example of how a lot of things in medicine um, may not. And another big one is, yes, hip surgeries are helpful in terms of the outcome they're measuring. So a lifespan, pain, infections, but it doesn't say anything about cognition. Also, so again, cognition is huge in my specialty, but also in just the general idea of delirium, short-term confusion, um, up to 50% of older 85 than adults, 50% may have an underlying cognitive impairment diagnosis that was undetected. And that's why they have the risk for being confused during the hospitalization, that surgery that may last up to three to six to 12 months. And so how important was that surgery? Even if it was an orthopedic hip surgery, which we found in medical fields is very important, but is longevity important to you? Is the cognitive impairment important to you? Like, yeah. So that's kind of where I, I would say that's the focus multi complexity for older adults. And it is true, studies don't really include older adults. They are more now, but it's not just that they don't include the older adult that we see that is in evident in the demographics. They exclude kidney disease, they exclude diabetes, they exclude older adults who are taking typical medications. Um, and the outcomes they measure are mortality, so death, yes cardiovascular outcomes, sure. But again, I, they don't talk about cognition or functionality or quality of life. Um, not much time left, but let's see how many more um, questions we get. Um, how does one access the MM MSSP service you mentioned and what services come with the complex chronic care designation? 
Um, again, within Kaiser, unfortunately, you have to, a uh, provider has to kind of be the one unless you bring it up, but um, it's usually for those who have multiple, again, a lot of medical conditions, hypertension, stroke, you know, multiple things, and are also unbefriended at the end of the day. That's sort of the idea of a flexible in, in indication criteria. It can't be due primarily to a psychiatric issue, cannot be due primarily due to a, a substance use disorder. Um, but the service that comes with it that I see is a nurse and a social worker attuned to you, checking in with you based upon um, requirements from Medicare, Medi-Cal. Um, every two weeks for a period of three to six months. And then sometimes um, they'll keep you on their list and check in, you know, every six months or so. The idea of case management is not my forte, but my understanding is that, you know, there's short-term stabilization, but a lot of these issues are social determinants of health. Are you going to solve housing in the, for that person in three months? Sometimes, but sometimes not. Are you going to solve social isolation? Are you going to solve um, their ability to make it to um, certain places in their life? Um, just functionality and transportation sometimes, um, but some of the ideas, the medical conditions come back or, um, you know, they lose a, a key trusted person in their life that was doing a lot of this for them. So case management, all it means is just more intense follow up and checkup. It still doesn't mean someone is holding your hand and filling out the paperwork for you and submitting it for you. A lot of these things require paperwork to get you services. They just know about services. They can advise you as to how to get that service done or to your care partner. Um, but at the end of the day, it's still up to the American individual to get the thing done. So, but that's chronic um, care, chronic conditions through Kaiser. Social worker and a nurse that's with you. Um, they sometimes do home visits. Uh, sometimes they don't need to and they can just call you, but they're checking in. We call these touch points every two weeks. Um, quite a few people actually asked um, if there is a way to contact you. <laughs> um, I think I forgot what we decided through Ashby Village, but I would defer to, to Bab and Roberta about that, but happy to be available. Okay, wonderful. Um, yeah, I think it's time. I mean, there's only one, two minutes left, you know, and I just wanted to say thank you very much again. I mean, for this really amazing presentation and all the information to you provide it for everybody. I uh, want everybody um, to uh, want also remind everybody that there is a YouTube uh, YouTube uh, video available, probably um, in the, sometime in the next couple of days. And um, Dr. Chen is uh, willing to share her presentation, so that's that's good, you know. So that you can look at that again. And um, oh yeah, and then there was the guide that Roberta mentioned at the beginning. This um, guide, this healthcare guide, is also or will be available on our website, um, if I'm not mistaken, and also in our office. Um, and with that, I want to thank everybody. I mean, who join us today and I hope you will join us again. Um, the next presentation will be on October 1st, again at 10 a.m. And um, the title of that presentation is Your Rights When Hospitalized. And last but not least, I want to mention that although Ashby Village webinars events are free for all to attend, Ashby Village relies on donations to bring programs such as this one to our members and friends. And with this, I say thank you again to everybody and have a wonderful day. Thank you for participating.